the Anunnaki Pantheon. What can be deduced about the Pantheon considering the sources that researchers made available about it? We have only pictures before the invention of writing which may have had religious significance. In reading the first cuneiform tablets, however, we encounter a world in which religious thought permeates everything. Invisible beings were believed to operate the entire cosmos and maintain it, and people felt surrounded by numerous gods and demons. The cosmos was ruled by demons, gods and goddesses in every respect, and new demons and gods continually appeared. It has been discovered that almost 3,000 Sumerian gods existed in prehistoric times without a definite human form. As early as the third millennium, we began to see images of anthropomorphic gods wearing a divine crown consisting of a pair of bullhorns, which could only be worn by the gods. Gods held in high esteem had more horns in their crowns, and they looked entirely different from demons and other singular-looking creatures from earlier times. The demons depicted on seals have an unreal, strange appearance, but gods from later times are modelled after kings and their courts, as was known in the third millennium. Temples were built, priests were appointed, and the king claimed exclusive rights to communicate directly with the gods. As the most important god in the Sumerian pantheon, he plays a vague and colourless role in mythology. Initially, he might not have been an actual Sumerian deity. Venus's goddess Inanna was associated with the planet Venus. She was also the city goddess of Uruk, where another god, An, the god of the Dome of Heaven, resided. Another god, Enki, was seated in Eridu, literally Lord of the Earth, the god of wisdom and magic. According to mythology, Inanna tries to steal Enki's power and bring it to Uruk by boat. An Eridu-Uruk power struggle probably led to this myth. Enlil, Lord Air, became increasingly important in the third millennium. He was the god of the space between heaven and earth. His temple was in Nippur, where the world axis and cosmic pillar that carried heaven's dome were located. As a result of this triad, on Enlil, Enki, they controlled the entire world's power. As they moved across the Dome of Heaven, the Sun, planets, the Moon and Venus followed their own courses. The Sumerian language does not distinguish between male and female words, which made the gods initially genderless. In this sense, Dum can refer both to son and daughter, and Dam can refer to both husband and wife. In the third millennium, however, gods began acting as ordinary human beings, with divine characteristics, as time progressed. All other gods were addressed as Lord, En, or Lady, Nin, except for the sun god Utu and the god of heaven An. The moon god Nana, the father of Inanna, was referred to as Lord Heaven, En An Na Ak, and Inanna as Lady of Heaven, Nin An Na Ak. In Greek mythology, the gods were given wives and gathered into one big family, while their wives and husbands mainly lived in the shadows. Having been married to the moon god Nana, Ningal became the mother of Inanna because the moon god was her father. Sun god Utu was the son of moon god Inanna, so he became her brother. During the third millennium, Enlil became the chief god of the pantheon and the priests and tablet writers made him the father of all the other gods. Sumerians and Akkadians viewed the world as a flat disk tossed on a sweet water ocean, while a great ocean filled with salt water and a dome of heaven below them. Among the stars and planets were the moon gods' sheep and cows, and the Kur's highlands, the realm of the dead, were located far from the inhabited world. In the later days, the netherworld was located beneath the Earth's surface, accessible via a gate in the west where the sun set each night. In the morning, the sun appeared above the mountains after traveling through the land of death. Only when humans die can they reach the land of no return. In prehistoric times, the cosmos and human lives were constantly threatened by dangerous creatures, and people believed that a demon caused their illness. 
They shared the same timeless, changeless space and belonged to the same cosmic world. There was no impenetrable screen between them. They fought against all kinds of demonic shrimps that threatened the universe's balance long before the gods existed. These monsters were apparently responsible for the succession in the sky of constellations that took turns each year, as we see them on cylinder seals. These monsters might represent Taurus and Leo zodiac signs, the Bull of Heaven and the Heavenly Lion. Taurus was the constellation at the beginning of spring. Leo was the constellation at the middle of summer. Sky-high competition seems to exist between the two constellations. When the Akkadians conquered Mesopotamia, they not only took over the Sumerian script, but also incorporated the Sumerian gods into their own pantheon, which had far fewer divinities. Sumerian gods received Semitic names. Nana, the moon god, was called Sin in Akkadian. Utu, the sun god, was called Ama, and Inanna, the goddess of Venus, was called Ishtar in Akkadian. The Goddess Inanna Uruk was the largest town in ancient times by the end of the fourth millennium. In the tablets found in the city, no mention is made of the long, slow development process. Cuneiform tablets are the only material sources containing highly concise information about Inanna. Iana's temple complex in Uruk contains the oldest tablets. Temple scribes must have written these, and the priests, preoccupied with maintaining the temple economy, commissioned them. Based on the information provided by the tablets, the temples were centers of industrial activity. It is clearly recognizable that grain, oil, beer, and their respective quantities are written on the reverse side of the notes detailing all the commodities received by temple personnel. Due to the lack of registered provenance, we cannot identify the goods' origin. They may have registered the yields of the temple fields. Perhaps they kept a record of what the locals had to pay the temple authorities as rent for exploiting the temple property. Perhaps they kept track of the taxes the surrounding cities had to pay to the temple. We also learn about the goddess Inanna on the tablets. Her written sign is recognizable on the tablets, even though we know very little about her. An oblong piece is fastened to the back of her symbol, which ends in a curl. The word group is sometimes preceded by another sign reading as exalted, eminent, or princely. The word group is thus read as exalted in honor or majesty in honor. Despite repeated interpretations, the meaning of Inanna's written sign remains to be seen. On cylinder seals from Uruk, we can see that the standard is just as high as that of a human being. Some cylinder seals and reliefs depict the sign perched on cattle pens with newborns peering out or surrounded by massive vessels. Sometimes they are arranged in pairs in front of a temple facade in a field. Two people stand beside two substantial storage jars as tall as they are. There may be a date pollinator or an ear of corn held by the left person. Inanna's symbol is in the hands of the right person. She is likely a woman because she has pigtails. On a big feeding trough of gypsum, a relief shows a reed sheepfold with Inanna's standards rising from the top, along with several rams and ewes and two newborn lambs. Again, we see the symbol of Inanna in the field. German archaeologist Walter André, who wrote about the construction of the earliest temples of Mesopotamia in 1930, was one of the first to suggest an interpretation of the symbol of Inanna. He notes that standards of reeds were made in Mesopotamia and Egypt by combining reeds and papyrus growing in the water and binding them into a reed pillar. This was done as soon as the water had withdrawn and fertile soil had become available. These twined constructions were likely erected at sacred places with a specific geographical characteristic, such as an essential route intersection, archaeologists have found. In later times, people erected the standard of a god or goddess on both sides of the entrance to their dwellings for the gods. 
The standards of all gods were probably placed near the temples and on cylinder seals. This can be observed easily. Inanna's standard was bent on top with a loose plume fanned downwards. A triangle adorned the standard of the moon god Nana. There appears to be a circle or ring on both sides of the shaft of the standard of the god of heaven, An. Enki's symbol was possibly a pole with two rings on the top. A cylinder seal depicted these symbols, which later served as writing signs to convey the names of these gods. After the Uruk period, these symbols lost their specific meanings, such as the standard with only one ring, which acquired the general meaning of sacred space. In addition to Enki, the goddess of sweet water, and Utu, this standard could also be erected near other temples. The Sumerian texts refer to Inanna's sign as MUS-3, which means scintillate, sparkle, and radiating stars, and was given a unique name in the writing system. MUS-3 signifies divine radiation, and other gods were also said to possess this quality, but Inanna is primarily associated with it. The MUS-3 may be the shining appearance of Venus, which emits the brightest light in the sky after the sun and moon. This could be seen as a representation of the standard that the Sumerians erected near the shrine of Inanna. According to a temple hymn about Inanna, she wears the MUS-3 crown as a wreath on her head. Inanna is the queen who adorns the woman who adorns the man's head with a helmet. In the form of lapis lazuli, she wears the MUS-3 crown, scintillating. In the MUS-3 crown, no details are given about what it looked like. It shares the same name as the headgear worn by the king and the high priestess, a veil-like adornment. It is more likely that Inanna's MUS-3 crown looked like that than it was the general term for all glittering crowns. During the second millennium, astrological texts predicted all sorts of things when Venus had a crown with a rainbow. Argul crown is the Akkadian name for this head covering. It resembles the stars in an Akkadian hymn. We have little information about Inanna, so we must make do with the scattered clues that have been preserved. However, with the help of these fragments, we can gradually gain an understanding of her. It is intriguing to note that Inanna's symbol is always depicted near abundant crops and animals, regardless of its meaning. Her role in cattle breeding and fertility of the land is evident. The Sumerian name for Inanna is Inanna Ak, which means Lady of Heaven. So her domain is the sky where Venus circles. Inanna's name also indicates the importance of the goddess, as noted in the written texts. Initially, Inanna's sex was indeterminate, since the word Nin in Sumerian was also used as a title for Lord. From the third millennium, she acquired personal traits, becoming a lady. Inanna Man was still worshipped in Mari in the third millennium, however. Scribes rarely wrote Inanna's name in full. Instead, they used her symbol, the ring standard, depicted by the MUS-3 sign. Even after 3000 BC, when the tablet writers no longer wrote wavy lines with their reed stylus, but made their cuneiform signs by pressing the stylus into soft clay, they still did not write Inanna's name in total, but with only one sign. The sign was inspired by her reed standard, but it became abstract and unrecognizable over time. As the script was written from left to right, rather than top to bottom, Inanna's sign turned a quarter turn to the left. Ancient people were cautious in using their names, because someone with bad intentions could misuse them. Divinity's name was too terrifying to pronounce aloud, so they preferred a circumscription. Thus, they referred to Inanna, or one of the many related goddesses from the surrounding cultures, as the goddess of the palace, or the goddess of the land, or the goddess of Nineveh. Inanna's name, Lady Heaven, 
was originally a circumscription. So tablet writers continued to use the MUS symbol of Inanna to conceal her real name. They also referred to the goddess with caution, later using various periphrases to describe her. There was a reference to Majesty Inanna on tablets found at Uruk in the Red Temple, the oldest part of the Ayana complex, as being exalted or majesty, Nun. It may have been given to Inanna because of her elevated and supreme position in the Pantheon, but it may also be a much older epithet. A flickering glow of the Venus planet in the evening sky might have led the Sumerians to call Inanna exalted when there were no anthropomorphic gods. The evening star, Venus, can still be seen on sunny evenings after the sun sets. Later sources do not refer to Majesty Inanna, perhaps because Evening Inanna partially replaced her. On the tablets of 3000 BC, two new names for Inanna appeared that describe her qualities as morning and evening planets, Morning Inanna and Evening Inanna. Evening Inanna, Inanna Sig. Venus orbits the Sun in a smaller circle than the Earth, which makes it an inner planet. Venus appears in the western evening sky once a year, in the eastern sky just before sunrise. Sumerians attributed Venus's two manifestations to two closely related gods. There is a possibility that morning Inanna was a male god and evening Inanna was a female goddess. Whichever the case, there were separate feasts for each goddess. An ancient hymn about Ebi and Inanna. The texts also mention another Inanna figure, adding Kur from the mountain. This probably refers to the mythological Kur, the mountain on which she was said to have been born. As the rising sun illuminated the Zagros Mountains in the east, the morning star skimmed past the Zagros Mountains and slowly became visible to the Sumerians. According to the 2200 BC text, Inanna appears above the mountains as the morning star. Nu Gig was another title used to address Inanna. Nu Gig Anna, for example, means Nu Gig of Heaven or Nu Gig of the God An. It used to be accepted that Nu Gig was translated as Hieridul by Assyrian scholars, but this has now been discarded. As opposed to the elevated status of the title, which was used primarily to praise the intense power and sovereignty of Inanna in heaven and earth, Inanna would unlikely be referred to as a temple slave, Hiera, Greek, holy, and Dule, Greek, enslaved person, or even a prostitute of the god An. In addition to holy people, impure or ill women were also separated from the community, including pregnant women, menstruating women, and those with certain diseases. Because of her association with mothers of newborn children, a midwife was also called a Nu Gig, Akkadian Kadistu. Nu Gig is composed of the words Nu and Gig, which means taboo, apart, holy. So Nu Gig should mean isolated human, taboo human, woman, or a sanctified person. According to the Sumerians, Inanna was a powerful goddess, and this is apparent from her deferential names, Lady of Heaven, Exalted Inanna, and Morning and Evening Inanna, scrutinizing Venus's movements in the sky punctually, sometimes appearing in the west, and at other times above the Zagros mountain range in the east. Furthermore, Inanna has always played a distinctive and self-willed role in the pantheon, as we can see from the myths recorded on cuneiform tablets. The Danish-American Sumerologist Thorkil Jacobsen suggested that Inanna's name did not mean Lady Heaven, but in an na ak Lady of the Date Clusters in Sumerian. An means both heaven and dates. Jacobsen understood this word as heaven during the Middle Ages. According to him, Inanna was seen by the Sumerians as the Newman in the date storehouse. Hymns featuring Inanna compare her lover's hair tuft to a date palm, 
and attribute date syrup's properties to a beloved king. As we can see in the earliest pictures of Sumerian gods and priestesses holding date palms, dates had a religious significance in Sumerian communities. Jacobson's interpretation, however, is only sometimes accepted. It is common for Sumerians to use the cuneiform sign An, a star, to symbolize heaven or the god of heaven An, and the word for a date is Zulum, not An. As a result, date palms were considered a crucial crop for the Sumerian community, and Inanna was considered to have a close relationship with them. Furthermore, her sign may represent the date clusters that hang below the date palm branches. By an Arabic proverb, a date palm must stand with its feet in the water and its head in the fire of heaven. This climate is especially prevalent in southern Mesopotamia, where summer temperatures can reach 45 degrees. But the tree is tolerant of the salty soil of the south and has adapted to these boiling temperatures. Despite the harsh climate of southern Mesopotamia, date palms thrived. The Sumerian economy depended heavily on the date. In Sumerian cooking and baking, dates were eaten fresh or dried. In addition to making flour out of dates, dates can be candied or used as ingredients in syrup. A vegetable that tastes like artichoke, an alcoholic drink made of dates, and cattle fodder made from the pits make up the date cluster. Medicines to treat stomach, liver, and intestine complaints contain dates as an essential ingredient. Using the bark, shoes could even be made. This fertility process was considered sexual by the Mesopotamian people. From the Akkadian verb rukubu, tarkibtu means to fecundate. The root rukabu means to ride, as when a male animal mounts a female to impregnate her the exact same meaning as fertilizing a plant. Walter André may have been right in his assumption that Inanna's standard with spiral and tuft was in fact a stylized rendering of a date palm, since the whole fertilization process was preeminently her domain. The Fertility Goddess Having Inanna on your side was of the utmost importance. A farmer feels obliged to Inanna for the fertility of his fields and livestock, as we can see in the images that her standard is always in the vicinity of an agricultural scene. Crop yields were greatly influenced by factors beyond peasants' control, making their lives harsh and uncertain. As a result, they assumed that these mechanisms resulted from magical personal forces that were stirring things up behind the scenes they attempted to appease these powers by offering flattering prayers and generous gifts, assuming these mighty powers behave just like humans do every day. Inanna was referred to as a cow, just like other goddesses, and later the gods were given horns from bulls to show their divine nature. The divine names in the cuneiform texts are preceded by another symbol, a star represented by a rosette probably because the stars also reminded people of meadows. In cuneiform texts, the rosette symbol became a dingir sign, a written sign of a god, which served as a determinative sign. But the rosette was always considered the unique mark of Inanna, and it represented especially her heavenly character, her star, the Venus planet, a rosette with six or eight petals. On the side of a feeding trough, we can see two standards of Inanna erected behind two sheep, with a rosette below their heads. Animals of Inanna can be read as the scene subject. Archaeologists consider Uruk's Red Temple an Inanna sanctuary because rosettes were found in the same district as tablets depicting offerings to Majesty Inanna, Inanna Nun. The rosettes must have decorated the temple and symbolized the goddess worshipped there. As a symbol of Inanna's mighty power, the lion also belonged to her. On a spouted pitcher from Uruk, circa 3000 BC, Inanna's standards are depicted between lions on cylinder seals, her foot elegantly resting on one. When the Sumerians prayed to Inanna, 
her symbols revealed more about their vision. Inanna's plumed reed standard was never used outside Uruk and was later used only as a cuneiform symbol. Inanna appears on stone reliefs and cylinder seals in the third millennium as a woman with a divine crown on her head and with cosmic attributes such as wings. In Sumer, it was impossible to distinguish between men's and women's clothes in the earliest depictions, as gods wore the same clothes as humans. In 2300 BC, we began to perceive gods and goddesses more clearly because they began to wear horned crowns and wreaths. When goddesses were first created, they all looked the same. On a relief from around 2400 BC, a goddess wears a large crown made of bullhorns. However, this goddess may not be Inanna, but Ninhursag, the birth goddess. In 2400 BC, King Enmitana of Lagash dedicated a basalt bowl shard to Ninhursag and carved relief on it. It is also characteristic of depictions of Inanna to have three stalks growing from her shoulders, a feature that will later evolve into the weapons of Inanna to be discussed further. As she wears her crown, two plants grow that look like ears of corn and resemble the Sumerian cuneiform sign SE, meaning barley. All crowns with this element have a trapezoidal middle piece. As a metaphor for abundance, Corn ears may symbolize abundance in Sumerian, called grain. Moreover, the date cluster she is holding might be misinterpreted as a fertility symbol, as Inanna was significantly associated with the ability to produce abundance. We see the same goddess on another relief with the same crown and branches growing from her shoulders, as a naked priest pours a libation over a stylized date palm jar. Date palm branches may refer to Inanna, but they could also represent fertility in general. The goddess might be Ninhursag, since she sits on top of a mountain range. Ninhursag literally means Lady of the Mountain Range in Sumerian. However, we cannot be sure of this, as Inanna was also born in the mountains. From the point of view of our time, it is usual to try to recognize each god as they are depicted in the images from this period. However, for the Sumerians, an image was never intended to be a resemblance, because they had no idea what a god looked like, thereby explaining why all gods are depicted in the same way. On a stela from the time of King Ur-Nansi of Lagash, circa 2500 BC, a female figure sitting on a throne can be seen but according to the inscription, this might be Inanna. The woman on the throne occupies the entire side of the stele, indicating her elevated rank over the king and his family. Her left hand holds a date cluster, and she is the central figure along with other figures on the stele. His demeanor is pious, his hands clasped, his head bald, and he is wearing a skirt around his hips on which it is written that he built the Ibgal. Bengal, literally Temple Oval, is the name of the Temple of Inanna in Lagash, so we might not be mistaken when we assume that the goddess on the throne is indeed Inanna. The reverse side of the stele depicts Er Nancy's family, and the bottom register shows a woman and her daughter drinking from a bowl face to face. As seen in this early image of Inanna, she is already in close contact with the ruling dynasty, a fact that will endure. During the third millennium, Inanna's wings and stalks became fixed. Utu is next to her, ascending from the mountain range with a saw in his hand, holding a date cluster in his left hand on a cylinder seal with the inscription Ada, tablet writer. A stream of water containing little fish surrounds the shoulders of Enki, the god of sweet waters. His faithful servant, Isimud, stands behind him in the form of a Janus figure with two faces. There needs to be a clear explanation for the double face of the messenger of Enki. He serves as a messenger for the gods, constantly conveying messages between the gods and the people. 
It is evident from Inanna's wings that she is the goddess of Venus, who appears in the morning earlier than the sun above the mountain range and announces its arrival. On a cylinder seal, Inanna is pictured holding a lion on lead strings. On the other hand, she is manipulating the seed funnel to fructify the soil, indicating that she is expected to provide for the fertility of the fields. We have tried to construct an image of Inanna by piecing together the tiny scratches of information that have survived since that great distance in time and how she gradually took on a human form, her normal fading away, but her remaining symbols, the star and the lion, always remaining with her. The Sumerians honored her with hymns and told myths about her long before tablet writers recorded the hymns or myths in which they honored her. Even though Inanna had not always been a city goddess of Uruk, Uruk's city goddess participated in the success since Uruk became such a significant economic power. A myth of Enmekar and the Lord of Arata suggests that the legendary city of Arata, which probably lay northeast of Mesopotamia past Elam, behind seven mountain ranges, worshipped Inanna as well, and the contest between these two rulers may provide insight into Sumerian history. Did they enter the Euphrates and Tigris plains from the east and bring their main goddess, Inanna? Her temple complex was already occupied by another god, An, the god of heaven. In mythology, An played a vague role. He may have been an old god at rest who had seen better days. Perhaps he wasn't a Sumerian god, but a native god of great importance. Script had yet to be invented at the time of these speculations, and we have no sources with sufficient details to satisfy our curiosity. People who lived in Sumer 5,000 years ago must have had a difficult time imagining their lives. In our attempt to understand these ancient people's worldview, we must make do with pictures without written explanations or with administrative texts never intended to aid us. Only after the invention of the script was it possible for a culture to record its myths and hymns, leaving some clues as to their preoccupations. Our earliest pictures are somewhat enigmatic, but around 3000 BC, pictures on cylinder seals and reliefs begin to convey a more transparent structure. An action appears to have been depicted, perhaps a ritual, as is found on a large vase buried deep in the earliest layers of Uruxiana complex. Apart from the fact that it gives us an insight into ancient Sumer's appreciation for the goddess Inanna, the vase is made of alabaster and was a very precious object. The presence of the goddess's standards in the upper segment indicates that the vase was connected to the temple of Inanna. If a new temple had been built, the storeroom might have been used to bury sacred utensils no longer in use. It is also possible that the priests hid the temple treasures to prevent theft or plunder by an enemy army. Archaeologists excavated a treasure hoard that had been carefully stored near Temple M, where the vase was found. German archaeologists call this hoard Sommelfund, and the objects are likely from the Red Temple. Baghdad's National Museum of Iraq houses the Uruk vase, an important exhibit. During the American invasion of 2003, the vase was stolen and returned after a few months heavily damaged. Archaeologists dated the vase to around 3000 BC, but it could have been much older. It shows signs of repair that had been done while the object was still in use and while it must have had a specific meaning for the Sumerians, it is unclear what it was. The vase stands more than a meter high. The upper segment shows reed standards behind a lady welcoming the procession. A scene depicting the goddess Inanna with offerings can be seen outside the vase. There are five registers of relief on the vase, separated by flat bands. We see grain stalks and date branches floating above the flowing waters of the Euphrates in the bottom register. A sheep and rams turn alternately to the right in the middle register. Nude males walk to the left in the next register. 
One of them is carrying a ritual spouted jar while carrying dishes filled with the fruits of the fields. Ancient Sumerian priests approached the gods naked, as was required by the gods. To prevent defiling the sacred space, they purified themselves and did not wear filthy clothes, nor were scars or other physical defects permitted on their bodies. All those who wanted to enter the sacred space were still required to follow these instructions in the Old Testament, Leviticus 21. It was reported that the vase was still intact when excavated in 1936. However, a fragment fell off during transportation, and the archaeologists could not recall how the relief had looked afterward. Unfortunately, the upper segment is poorly damaged. Missing from the procession is the central figure. The only visible thing is his foot and extended waistband, which is held in place by a little follower. The checkered design on the skirt has proven invaluable to identifying this individual, and a small piece of his skirt is still visible. A man wearing precisely the same skirt can also be found on cylinder seals in the Samofund of Uruk, where the Uruk vase was excavated. The Uruk vase also shows the same person, so we are close to the mark. Inanna's standards rise behind the animals as the same man in a net skirt feeds sheep and rams with two branches and a rosette. Often, this person is shown holding an ear of corn for the cattle near Inanna's standards, his small disciple following close behind him, also wearing a net skirt but a little shorter. Two seals from the art market show the same persons with food offerings in Inanna's granary. On his head, a wreath is worn by the big man wearing a net skirt, while his little disciple tags along behind him. This man in net skirt and his votary will be identified in due course, but first our attention must be drawn to the woman standing before Inanna's temple. A man in a net skirt watches an offering carrier presenting a copiously filled dish to a woman in a long gown. Despite the damage to the vase, there is still a lump visible which may indicate a crown or tall hat. She is standing before a granary packed to the roof with abundant agricultural and livestock production. In Sumerian, Kiri Sutag means literally to bring the hand to the nose and she uses it to salute the man at the front of the procession. Two MUS-3 standards depicting Inanna are behind her. It is possible to answer whether the woman depicted on the vase is the goddess Inanna or a priestess who served in the temple of Inanna in various ways. According to Julia Asher Grieve, Inanna would have stood on a podium or sat on a throne if she were the goddess. Later pictures of Inanna usually show her face full on, her head turned away from the cult activities, as expected in earlier pictures. Additionally, Kiri Sutag indicates that the woman cannot be a goddess because, Asher Greaves notes, the greeting is essentially a mark of honor paid to a god or a higher authority. Consequently, she concludes that the woman must be a priestess of a lower rank than the man in the net skirt. The identity of the woman on the Uruk vase remains unclear. The fact that she is wearing a crown with bull horns reinforces the idea that she is Inanna herself. As priestesses are conveyed, they are almost always seated on thrones, while goddesses can stand. Gods may lift their hands to greet the king with a salutation regardless of rank. A kirisu tag tells much more about a person's rank than a salutation. Humans avoided offending a god or person of high status with foul breath by holding their hands in front of their mouths. Therefore, Asher Grieve has already suggested that the woman on the Uruk vase is indeed a priestess of Inanna. There is a possibility that the woman's hat is the tall crown of a priestess. Still, Inanna is already represented on the vase by her two standards, and goddesses at the time were probably not anthropomorphized. In the same way that establishing the woman's identity on the Uruk vase presents difficulty, the man's identity in the net skirt poses similar difficulties. 
does he belong to the gods or to the human species? A figure with the sign N has already been found in ancient cuneiform texts. Our language lacks an appropriate term for this sign, so we translate it as city ruler or priest, the N being the Sumerian leader. Even their land is named after their N, Kengi, land of the princely N, Ki Engi, bringing us to the man in the net skirt. What kind of N was he? To better understand the meaning of the N during Sumer's early period, the Sumerians wrote the name N in cuneiform. As the N was responsible for harvesting, the N sign might represent a cultivated parcel of land that grows a flourishing branch, while the stripes might represent canals that drain redundant water from the fields. A mistress or lady is often called Nin in the texts. The sign for Nin consists of the signs Sal and Nam. There were also Nins among the high priestess and queen in addition to Inanna. The word Nin originally could also refer to a male title, master, but around the time this sign was formed, it had already taken on a single meaning, high lady or mistress. According to Shavat, the Nin in earlier texts may have been more important than later, and in the fourth millennium, they must have been quite independent. Her responsibilities included producing and distributing grains, bread, cattle, fish, textiles, and ritual activities. A staff of servants was at her disposal, including perhaps farmers and priests, and harp music was played during rites. As the texts mention a regular ceremony, written with the sign Na, in which the N and the Nin play leading roles, it appears that the N and the Nin were partners in a fertility cup. The ritual was vital to stimulating the fertility of the fields, cattle, fish and birds, since Na signifies bed and to lie. These may be signs of an N-Nin marriage celebration. From later texts, we know that once a year, the N traveled to the temple of Inanna to celebrate the goddess's wedding night with her. These rites were performed to magically enhance crop yield in ancient times. This issue will be discussed later. A very ancient text, it addresses the goddess of the temple Irigal of Uruk, located in Kulbab, a goddess associated with Inanna. Uruk's patron goddess Inanna had a close relationship with the En. The En and Nin are both mentioned in a temple hymn praising the mother of Kulab, Inanna. Despite praising the temple, the hymn says that En was created by the heavens and the earth, while the Nin was created by Kulab's walls. It was evident that both the En and the Nin participated in this divine power in the city in this case Kulab, because it was where God had his seat. It is stated in the hymn that a cosmic N was created by heaven and earth, and an earthly N and Nin also emerged from the inner walls of the district of Kulab, fulfilling the mandate of the cosmic prototypes by performing certain temple rites for fertility. Aside from the Uruk vase, some cylinder seals were found in the temple hoard, which may depict figures of the En and Nin. The figures on these cylinder seals represent En and Nin, the priest and priestess who serve Inanna and oversee her affairs. A small votary of the Urukvas man in the net skirt appears on this cylinder seal wearing a short net skirt. A man in the net skirt is carrying a giant ear of corn while the woman holds the sacred standard of Inanna over the storage containers. The N and Nin appear to play equal roles based on these cylinder seals. The Nin appears even more potent than the N on some cylinder seals from Uruksayana district. These seals, however, are likely older. A woman sits on a bench with her legs bent in a rounded fashion in front of a man in a short net skirt. Her right knee is raised, and she holds a cup in her right hand as she sits on her left leg. On the left, 
a servant is holding a bowl on the ground while the man in the short net skirt pours a liquid into the woman's bowl. We can see the temple's facade behind the woman and the little jars displayed around them. A ritual action between the En and Nin is depicted, possibly with the high priestess of the temple receiving offerings. Private art collectors in the Middle East purchased several sculptures during the 19th century and donated them to museums. Possibly dating back to 3000 BC, they depict a naked male figure, but it is unknown where these statues were found. Figures wear hats with rolls to become the permanent headdresses of Mesopotamian kings. Male figures with beards and nakedness indicate a ritual meaning, as noted before. In many cultures, nakedness is prescribed, and the prohibition of wearing hats and shoes in mosques remains in effect. Possibly superseding the requirement of nakedness was the opaque net skirt of the N, which exposes his naked body. These limestone sculptures may be representations of the N during a ritual action, since a ritual beard was a symbol of dignity and was only worn by gods or the community's ritual leader. The Pose Perhaps he was holding reins for oxen he would lead over the fields to bless, perhaps the reins for a team of oxen yoked to the plough. In the third millennium, the end disappears as a shepherd of his people, and the cylinder seals show only his disciple wearing a shorter net garment, closely followed by the man in his long net skirt. As the Nin has disappeared, the goddess emerges as Uruk's exclusive partner, combining the worldly mandate of the N with his religious duties as the former N priest. The goddess is now only represented by symbols, so she has exclusive rights to maintain direct contact with her. According to Sumerian literary sources, the N was the leader of Uruk, residing in the temple and responsible for fertility and the welfare of the land. He is depicted as looking more like a supernatural being, feeding cattle with rosettes or large bushels of grain stalks and having multiple cylinder seals. The man in the net skirt seems to have been involved in a cosmic action related to the well-being of the natural world, though it may also have represented the leader of Uruk taking care of his cattle and the people of the land as a symbol. A stele may depict this figure performing another function, such as a warrior aiming his bow and arrow at wild animals, rather than as a priest making offerings. His hair is chignoned, he wears a turban on his head, and he has a long beard. He is dressed in his net skirt and turban. This very same figure is shown on cylinder seals, and it is possible that these images also served a symbolic, possibly even propaganda function. In this case, we see the vigilant shepherd, the ruler, protecting his cattle, his subjects, from dangerous wild animals, the enemy. Through the centuries, it has been widely distributed to present the image of the righteous shepherd as the protector of his flock. According to a Sumerian proverb, people without rulers are like sheep without shepherds. As we can see on some cylinder seals from Uruk, N wears a smooth garment, performs both religious duties and enforces public order, which requires him to be ruthless. Different impressions on lumps of clay have been found by archaeologists and reconstructed to form a picture that must have appeared on the original cylinder seal. Supervising the torture of naked prisoners is a man wearing a turban and wearing a smooth garment rather than a net skirt. In the fourth millennium, Uruk colonists settled on the eastern land of Ilam near the town of Susa, where this man is likely from. Elam's influence was also evident in Uruk and Egypt during this period, according to other findings. A cylinder seal from Susa depicts the same scenes, such as the N aiming an arrow at an unarmed nude person with a bow and arrow in front of the temple facade. It is unclear what these seals are used for. Burma, who studied these seals from Uruk, 
has prudently concluded that they may have been used to seal doors rather than containers with food. A man in a smooth garment is also challenging to interpret, and images of him do not reappear after the Uruk period. 